The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I am your host, Michael McAuliffe. With me in the studio is my co-host, Perry Haichu. And our special guest today is local attorney, Bruce Gale, who has been, uh, who is a friend of Weekend and has been uh, an attorney in this town for many, many years. Uh, I don't want to give away your age, but it's it, it's a long time. <laughs> so anyway, we're bringing you the news uh, for from the Nevada medical marijuana program and uh, legalization effort, as well as news beyond Nevada. And uh, there has it's been a relatively quiet week here in the state of Nevada. Um, uh, there's only one news story that has come up, and it showed up in the uh, Las Vegas Review Journal just yesterday, uh, and it was a story that they picked up from the Associated Press. Uh, author Kristen Wyatt uh, wrote from Lyons, Colorado, uh, that the uh, the marijuana industry there, the legal marijuana industry, is moving into the food industry, into the restaurant industry, and uh, they show a. a the writer writes about um, a restaurant where a hundred diners were paying a two hundred dollar a plate dinner uh, that started with a and with uh, smoked citrus smelling marijuana strain to go along with a full uh, fall salad with apples dates and bacon followed by a darker sweeter strain of pot to accompany a main course of slow roasted pork shoulder and a mold sauce with charred root vegetables and rice and for dessert they were having marijuana infused chocolate of course uh, <laughs> grated over salted caramel ice cream and paired with coffee infused with non-intoxicating hemp oil. Well, it's so nice that they finish that with that non-intoxicating hemp oil after they've just blasted <laughs> the for the for the first three courses of dinner. Um, but this, as the author said, is a welcome to fine dining in weed country. Hmm. And the marijuana industry in general is trying to move away from the pizza and Doritos uh, stereotype <laughs> that it has and uh, is trying to move into something that is a little more um, upscale. Uh, you know. So do you think that with that the uh, industry will maybe start pushing to get into nicer parts of certain towns instead of being confined to certain areas because here in Las Vegas you know we have very very few dispensaries in upscale neighborhoods mm -hmm. and they're almost all confined to I don't want to say like more industrial style areas or you know th things of that nature so not, not necessarily that's not a but across the board thing but you know what I mean if they're trying to move away from that like okay example Inyo mm -hmm. over on Maryland Parkway when they opened there was a Domino's Pizza that was located across the street from them. They closed and reopened in the suite directly adjacent next door to Inyo. So when you look, there's both things there. So of course, I'm sure it's good for business, but like mm -hmm. you said, maybe not exactly what Inyo was intending. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, but uh, I believe that the MMEs, uh, even the dispensaries, were all uh, relegated to uh, commercial zones uh, or industrial zones. They, they didn't want them too close to residences to begin with, and certainly in the upscale neighborhoods, some of our, our fine, upstanding city councilmen and the like didn't really want them in their backyards. Well, you're absolutely correct on the first part, and I'd say you're, you're right on the second part. The uh, SB 374, which Governor Sandoval signed in June 2013, it, uh, the zoning was limited to, quote, commercial or industrial or overlay. So, yeah, you're right. And mm -hmm. some of the local jurisdictions, um, you know, they, they didn't want it in certain areas. It's too bad it's not out in some of nice areas, which I won't mention, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, we'll leave that as it is. Yeah. There you go. Well, um, 
one of the growers uh, of one of the strains served at this dinner, a fellow named Alex Perry, uh, said it won't be long until marijuana's flavors and effects are parsed uh, as intently as wine profiles. And we've talked about that a number of times on this show, Perry, where uh, ultimately, uh, after legalization, you'll have your, you know, your, your $50 an ounce Schweg night train pot, your $150 an ounce Budweiser level pot, and still up your $400 plus an ounce level uh, boutique winery pot. So what does that mean? Are we going to have uh, sensimolier classes, as I, Michael Jameson uses that term, to his, some of his bud tenders mm -hmm. describe themselves as that? But seriously, that could be a serious term here in the next decade if what you, if what this article is saying is true and this continues to develop. You'll have, I guess, you'll have to have some kind of serious qualification to be able to uh, be certified to able to. Uh, I don't. I, I don't exactly know how would you you know certify someone to be a, a set small yeah who would be the authority on that I guess you'll have to create a curriculum and just well, go with I, it. I think it is very similar to a sommelier uh, because there is such complexity in wine uh, as compared to say tobacco where you've got you know your regular tobacco your menthol tobacco or maybe right or cherry flavored cigars or something but in in general uh, there are so many varieties of cannabis and so many. Um, uh, different descriptions of strains from people. Uh, to me, most of it, uh, when I was smoking it, most of it was, uh, okay, it tastes like pot, smells like pot, you know, well, okay, maybe, well, you a little know, sweeter, uh, maybe a little harsher, but, um, but there are a lot of subtleties that uh, it takes a developed palate to, um, to discern. Do you know anyone who's into cigars? Like really, really into cigars, gets really deep into the flavor? Because, you know, there are certain people who are very picky. They have cigar bars and your little lockers and the whole thing. Maybe something like that will come of cannabis to where you might not necessarily have like a cigar expert telling you around, but you kind of do it yourself. I'm not exactly sure if the same kind of thing applies with uh, with wine that does with, with the cigar industry, but I don't know. I'm just trying to think. You know. I, I don't know. <laughs> My experience with cigars has not been good. No, I know. don't really enjoy it's them. Really but result in nausea. <laughs> no, I don't like <laughs> no. them personally, but it seems like people get you know really into the... Uh, smoking so we'll, so we'll see it, it's interesting to see what they're doing here in Colorado because with this restaurant and doing this kind of dinner um, they can't actually cook it and directly into the foods and serve it what they have to do is sell hmm. people uh, a, a separate uh, goodie bag of these different strains and uh, they have somebody to roll them up in the joints or in the case of, uh, <laughs> in case of the dessert ice cream they give them a cannabis infused uh, chocolate and a little grater and so they grate it over their ice oh. cream because they're allowed to to serve the stuff they're allowed to sell it but they're not allowed to to do them both together and so this is this is part of the brave new frontier uh, of of a new cannabis industry. And currently, Alaska is the only state that allows for on-site consumption um, of of products that are are sold with cannabis in them. Yeah, and I think and they're still chewing through the details of that in regulation. They are. They, you know, it, it just goes to show how difficult it is and how long it takes to get some of this into law. And we saw Bruce that in uh, uh, in 2013, uh, SB. Uh, 374 was passed and it took two years for the first dispensary to open so wh what do you what do you think for the future if if uh, question two does pass how long do you think that it would be before uh, some of these recreational places open up well I'm hoping it'll be uh, shorter than what happened with the medical um, the uh, my recollection is the first public comment period was in October 2013 that the, the division had and they finalized the regulations uh, uh, April 1st 2014 that was a statutory deadline and the applications were due on August 3rd through August 8th mm -hmm. uh, or August 3rd through August 8th of 2014 yeah. and then the division came out with their decision I think on Monday November 3rd mm -hmm. so it was it was um, it was about a year and a half and I'm hoping the division, of course, now with, with the, if, if adult use passes, you have the Department of Taxation mm -hmm. is going to be involved. Mm -hmm. in, and hopefully, uh, you know, they're involved now as far as medical, but just for like collecting taxes. But they're going to be administering the program similar to the division. So hopefully, uh, you know, there's been a, a large learning curve and they can copy. And 
Um, hopefully, it'll be a shorter period of time. It should be. I'm do hoping. You th do you think that the um, the bigger effect um, in the short to medium term uh, will be uh, economic for the uh, businesses that want to open up, or uh, from less people getting arrested and therefore wasting resources in the justice justice system? Hmm. Would you state the question? Okay. Basically, do you do you think that um, do you think that in, in the first couple of years of this program, you're going to have more of an effect from uh, from people who are looking to get into the business and make money and get licensed, or do you think the state is going to realize uh, better economic return from the fact that you will have uh, you know many many less people being arrested and and prosecuted for these minor crimes? Well, I hope it's I hope it's both. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we can talk about question two, and uh, I asked some statistics regarding, you know, Clark County election, uh, the, re the voter registration. Today is the last day of voter registration. Mm -hmm. It ends uh, 8 o'clock tonight, and then you have uh, two hours and 59 minutes if you want to go online, I yeah. think. But uh, anyway, so um, we can talk more about question two. I hope it's going to pass. I think, well. Well, let me just say, I think it's going to pass. Um, yeah, what we've been looking at so far, the numbers that we've been looking at, we had Joe Bresney from the Yes on Question 2 campaign last week, and uh, he's predicting, um, cautiously predicting, that we should get about 53% of the vote for uh, <coughs> this issue, which would indicate a six point spread. And, um, uh, you know, that, that gives a little insurance on it, I guess. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But ultimately, it will be economically great for the, for the state. And, you know, I, in Arizona, we also have a, um, uh, an initiative on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And uh, just last week, uh, two former DEA agents uh, went to Arizona State University uh, in an attempt to get the 80,000 college students there to vote yes on their legalization initiative. Hmm. And th these guys, uh, Finn Salander and Michael Capasso, who were former special agents, uh, spoke to the students and explained why they supported uh, this initiative. And Capasso said he supports legalizing marijuana because it doesn't have the collateral damage that other drugs do, like addiction or overdose. And because of that, he thinks that it's practical to regulate marijuana, like alcohol, and use the tax revenue to fi fund state programs. And you know, he, he says that it doesn't have the collateral damage. That's because he never got raided or arrested. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how much collateral damage you can have when you're the target of an investigation. Uh, so uh, he said he's supporting uh, Prop 205 because it will make the community safer. And law enforcement, and I agree with this wholeheartedly, has more important things to do than arrest adults for simple marijuana possession. So uh, we see. You know, that's, that's really great when you've got people who were formerly making their daily bread from arresting people. And, and these, these two guys were working on marijuana crimes. And so they have realized the futility of this and, and are saying, let's take a step back from that brink of madness. There's a bunch of those cops from LEAP, the Law yes. Enforcement Against Prohibition mm -hmm. group that kind of bounce around the country and speak at these various things. I was at Denver at the 420 celebration a couple of years ago, and they had a couple of guys from LEAP there talking about you know, why they, not well, not to say flip sides, but now that they're not kind of under the thumb of their bosses they're kind of free to speak their minds as former enforcement officers and just kind of give their perspective i think it's a wonderful thing for them to come out and uh i guess show their support speak be brave yeah be brave yeah. you know yeah because i can't imagine that goes over too well with a lot of the fraternal no, brothers and, and things and like that a lot of these uh, a lot of these guys uh, have been prohibited or reprimanded uh by their departments if they uh had made comments uh while they were still on the job so uh mm -hmm. you know most of these people have to wait until they're retired. And certainly, we have people involved in the medical marijuana industry here in Nevada who are former law enforcement. And oh, sure, that grinds my gears, but uh, it grinds me down a little bit because I, I, I have my own kind of selfish opinion on that. But they really liked that on the application process. They wanted that law enforcement experience to show their security expertise, I suppose, for that part of the yeah. application. So regardless, it makes it made sense to have a cop on the well, team. Well, everybody's going for their own economic interest because also in Arizona, uh, I saw this story uh, come out that um, the Services Group of America, uh, whose subsidiary, Food Services of America, uh, 
do donated $80,000 to the measure to defeat the legalization in Arizona. And why is this important? Because this Services Group of America, they're the ones who have the food concession for the prisons in Arizona. Mm. So it is in their economic best interest to keep the uh, to keep the prisons as full as they possibly can. And so they wouldn't want to risk losing a, a dollar in their profit line by coming up with rational and sane marijuana That's policy terrible. in the country. It's, it's, you know, it, it's absolutely absurd. Hey, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we're going to talk about uh, Bruce's plans for the future here. Stay with us. Nevada Pure is a premier, vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, in a safe, private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well-being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Did you know that your medicine could contain pesticides, heavy metals, and even mold? Are you really sure that you're getting the same potency every single time? Well, the answer to that question is simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a state-approved laboratory run by scientists. So look for the Digipath Labs quality seal on your next medicine and on your favorite dispensary. To learn more, go to digipathlabs.com. That's D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Um, we're here with uh, our guest, Bruce Gale, who is uh, running for a district court judge position. And tell us why that's important to this community. Well, you never know when you might be in front of a judge. And there's, in my humble opinion, there's, I guess, three critical factors or components to a good judge. Experience, experience, experience. You want a judge who's, who knows the law and also is going to be fair and impartial and finally has a good judicial temperament. So I think those are three of the most important things uh, in, in the judge. Uh, absolutely. And uh, I think, you know, experience is very important, but um, uh, attitude and outlook is, is also important. And I know that judges are, uh, are nonpartisan. And so it, it's not a, a, a Democratic or Republican affiliation. Uh, yet at the same time, uh, most people involved in politics in any way, shape, or form are, are uh, you know, on one side or the other of that partisan divide. And um, while we can't make endorsements as a, um, uh, as a nonprofit, we can certainly point out to the voters that the person that you're running against um, his dad is one of the leading opponents in the legislature uh, against any sort of reform. And from what I've been able to dig up on your opponent, uh, he's no friend to reform either. And um, the people who are our target audience and who are uh, going to vote on this issue uh, should be informed voters and should know uh, that uh, someone who is going to be uh, you know, their choice for judge uh, is going to be more understanding of this issue and not quite so reactionary doctrinaire on, on the other side. And I, I know you're limited. It, it's an odd thing we have in this country where politicians can say all sorts of lies to you at any point in time, except if you're running in the judiciary, you're, you're limited uh, on what you can say. You're not supposed to really talk about things that, that might come up before you. But you can still make general um, political views known. That's Your true. There's a, the Supreme Court of the United States decision, Minnesota versus White, and there was a subsequent Supreme Court case that came out. But, uh, Michael, I can tell you, and as you well know, you know, I, I've been involved, I first met you, you know, in 2010 at mm -hmm. a certain uh, Clark County political convention. Yes. And, uh, and then I m w met you again in 2013, and I've been involved in, you know, medical marijuana since 
you know, April 2013, when uh, the various drafts of Senate Bill 374. So in the, in the interest of full disclosure, I've been involved in medical marijuana since then. I represented applicants on the state application, also with the local jurisdictions, uh, unincorporated Clark County, uh, city, of Las, uh, city of North Las Vegas, and I have some ownership interest in some medical marijuana establishments that have cultivation and production in North so Las then, Vegas. Then let me ask about that. If you were then um, elected to, the, to this position, would you have to um, divest or blind trust that while you were uh, uh, in a sitting uh, in the judiciary? Because uh, you know it could be said that you you have a conflict if you want to let people go who have uh, uh, pot charges against them so they can patronize a business that you have a piece of? Or? No, I've, I've looked at the revised uh, Nevada Code of Judicial Conduct on this issue. I would not have to divest myself of my ownership interests, but I could not take a management position. So in other words, I could not be active. You know, I couldn't be a managing member of the LLC. Mm -hmm. um, and. and uh, and so, because the the state, uh, the, the the bar association was soliciting comments just a couple of months back on uh, what kind of restrictions to put a, on attorneys on uh, who are going to be involved in this business, and I, I understand they haven't come to any decisions on that yet. I was at that hearing in front of the Supreme Court, and um, they extended the uh, the filing period for uh, the comment period for an additional twenty days, and. There, as you well know, you know Justice Seda has retired from the bench, Supreme Court. So there were six justices, and there was, you know, pretty much three different uh, possible. If you, if I read the justices correctly, there's pretty much, you know, three ways or schools of thought in which they were considering going. But I haven't looked to see if they've made a. I haven't heard they've, that they made a final decision on this. And uh, there was some pleas to them to. At least wait till after. Let's wait until after Tuesday, November eighth, and see what happens see with what question the two. Yeah. yeah. See what happens with question that, two. That, that makes sense. So uh, beyond Nevada, again, we just talked about Arizona a little bit ago. Um, I, I see a couple of stories here from Utah that are really um, interesting to me. The first is that the LDS leaders, uh, the, the the Church of the Latter Day Saints, um, are asking Mormons to oppose the legalization of uh, recreational marijuana in any state that it's on the ballot mm. and their first presidency is is saying no we we don't want to do this and and in letters that were sent Wednesday to Arizona, California, Nevada. Uh, their president, Thomas S. Monston, uh, uh, and his counselors said, we urge church members to let their voices be heard in opposition to the legalization of recreational marijuana. And he says drug abuse, in this letter, he says the drug abuse in the United States is at epidemic proportions and that the dangers of marijuana to public health and safety are well documented. Um, he goes on to say the accessibility of recreational marijuana in the home is also a danger to children. Now just last week we were talking about this Perry and uh, with Joe about how they they couch things in half truths Academ epidemic proportions. Yes, if we're talking about opioids. Yeah, sure, exactly, of course, but they never they opioids. never want to differentiate between the drugs. I was at uh, I was at Kmart getting some Halloween lights yesterday and there was a booth out front people trying to raise money to get the Dare program back in school. Oh. And I walked up to him and I'm like, you know, I am not I am not down with your guys' program. Like, I remember when I was a little kid, they used to have the anonymous box where they say, oh, you know, you can tell us whatever you want, and if, you're, if you think friends or family members are using drugs, you know, just put it in the box, and, and everything will be okay or whatever. Basically encouraging children to rat their, their parents and family members and friends out for using non, you know, for being nonviolent citizens and using cannabis. And they're like, oh, you know, well, we changed the program and this and that. It's not about marijuana. It's about other drugs and bullying and this and that. I'm like, well, if it's about bullying, why does your shirt say dare to keep kids off drugs? Yeah. You know, and it's just like, like you said, they code everything in such half, tr half truths to push their agenda through uh, and try to reinstill the brainwashing of our youth through donations now because the public won't fund it. And the thing is, it, it, it didn't even work. Uh, Dare uh, had, had it, a national study was done about the effects that that uh, education that they give. Yeah, it educated children. me about drugs. I didn't know what the hell weed was until my Dare officer came in and enlightened me about everything. It, it made <laughs> no difference. In I had no idea. I was in a nice little bubble. Every demographic group, there was no difference before and after the training, except for one, which was 
the tweener girls, preteen girls, who were more likely to use drugs after they had a dare program yeah. than than the ones who did not. It's because you get a crash course in what everything is. It I had no idea what LSD or go. cocaine was until my I dare know. officer had to barge into my room and show us what what was going on. I'm like, what you know, what is all this? Uh, your tax dollars at work, but you know, the idea that they that they say here in in this Mormon letter is uh, accessibility of recreational marijuana in the home is a danger to children. Well, once again, this is personal responsibility, and whether it's pot or whether it's opioids or whether it's booze or whether it's tobacco well a lot of mormon or, families or, have or firearms those, or in the, the house gel pack, you know laundry yeah detergent. like yeah like joe was saying with the gel pack uh, for the tide pods but like you know a lot of mormon families uh, are hunters and and things like that there's a lot of exposure to firearms should people be up in arms about exposing their kids to guns and how dangerous that is of course not because the parents are pretty responsible mm -hmm. why can't we put that same level of responsibility to there why why is it society's problem to take care of this I, I think if they were going to respond to that in any reasonable fashion they they would probably say something to the effect well if you've got the parents using drugs then the parents are no longer responsible so we need to and it's interesting because because it's all these these conservative small government right wingers who are saying we need to essentially have the nanny state because you can't trust the parents to be responsible. Just pick them. and choose when they want to, just like anybody else. They pick and choose their dogma or religious people or political people that are an extremist. You know, choose a piece of it and kind of shove it over here, and then we'll uh, we'll back off of it when it applies to them. It's I don't know. So it's pretty hypocritical. Also up in Utah, to, to in, a, in a somewhat related story, um, uh, there there's a fellow running uh, for governor, uh, Mike Weinholz, and he's the Democratic uh, nominee for governor of, of Utah. And um, uh, apparently a federal investigation found out that his wife, Donna, tried to mail some marijuana to herself at an out-of-state address. And it was apparently uncovered by dr a drug-sniffing dog. And so the federal prosecutors looked at this and they decided they're not going to file criminal charges uh, against Against this candidate's wife, but they kicked it over to the uh, to state level prosecutor in um, in Salt Lake City, and the state level prosecutor said, "Well, we can't do that because we know these guys." So there's a conflict there. So they wound up sending it uh, to uh, the, the chief deputy of Tui County, where I I haven't even heard of to tell you the truth so some small county in, in utah and so they're they're going ahead and prosecuting uh this woman and um she, he and they're doing this in part because he came out at the democratic convention and declared that his wife was be was using this and he said i thought it was necessary to be open and honest with the delegates now she's using it because um uh she's using it for uh, medication for arthritis and so she has she had some of this stuff and i guess they were going out of state and so she tried to mail herself some medicine <laughs> and, and got so caught with it like that just sounds crazy. You're mailing weed from Utah, yeah, to some. You know, usually just, it's coming. I, I don't know. It's just, it's like <laughs> be, uh, <laughs> you know, to so some place she was going to be, and and they caught her. Now, so what, I, what I found interesting was that that she turned over to investigators about two pounds of medical marijuana. Holy cow! And, and they they have said there's no indication that she's selling that this was personal use, and and that's fine. Two pounds doesn't bother me at all. But uh, what I find interesting is that the amount that she had without any intent to distribute would be misdemeanor possession. And two pounds is, of two, weed in Utah is misdemeanor possession? Yeah. You know, and in in Nevada here, what's what's the felony level of, of possession for marijuana, Bruce? Boy, you know, I should know that, and... I'll give you a hint. Isn't it? It's like, one ounce. Yeah, I was just yeah, going to say, yeah, isn't yeah, it an ounce unless no, you have no. a card? And, and, yeah, sure. if, if you don't have a card... And even if you have a card, it's what? It's two and a half it's ounces? two and a half ounces. And so... <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, in in a state that is is redder, more conservative than Nevada, you know, and and Perry, oh, you said when I showed you the story before the show, you you said something to the effect that if if it was you who had that, oh, I can't imagine if I got caught with two pounds of weed in my car in Utah, I can't imagine what would happen. 
I don't want to think about it. It would it would not but roll so like simply as a simple misdemeanor possession. Like They'd probably take my car and all kinds of... Yeah. It, it would be more than a misdemeanor possession charge, I would like to imagine, well, for sure. You'd probably be charged with tra trafficking, you yeah. know, not just mere possession. Unbelievable. Because yeah. obviously you had an intent to sell, intent right. to distribute, where the... Political. Whereas the life of the life yeah. of a gubernatorial candidate, oh, there's there's no intent to say, and I'm not trying to say that there was or yeah. anything, because many cases, and I'm sure you, having defended people in the past, uh, have seen any number of cases where uh, law enforcement, uh, you know, stretches that probable cause as, as as far as they can. And is there a little politics going on? What if it was what if it was a Republican candidate's wife? You know, just uh, just a little trivia. Uh, you know, the state of Utah hasn't not, uh, Utah hasn't gone for a, a Democratic presidential candidate since 1964. Oh wow! Right? Okay. And Minnesota hasn't gone for a Republican since 1972. So what 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 if it, the candidate was a Republican? Yeah. Yeah, well, right, then, then they might not. Have, this might not have come to light at all. Well, it's I, good to have juice, I guess, huh? Uh, it, it always is. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to see what's going on and just point out the, the disparity of what's happening here. And, well, I, I don't think anybody should do a day in jail. I don't think, and, and there's nothing to say that of she course. was arrested. And I don't think anybody should be prosecuted for personal use of cannabis. Um, but, you know, it, it's still so fraught with, with influence, and um, I, I'm sure if it had been some kid from a you know a, a, a ghetto area in in Salt Lake City or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I wonder how many people are in jail because of possessing way less, way less. weed than that in Utah Absolutely. right now. Yeah. Well, we're we're gonna uh, with that we're gonna take another quick commercial break, and we'll be back in just a minute. From the soothing sounds of a waterfall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flowers, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. We're here uh, with my co-host Perry Haichu and our guest Bruce Gale, who is running for district court judge uh, as a uh, nonpartisan race here in Clark County. Uh, and so I, I've got to ask you about this uh, uh, this case that I've seen, and it's it's come out of um, Minneapolis, and it comes uh, uh, from the Minneapolis Star Tribune and by author Brandon Stahl. And he's talking about uh, somebody who, who got SWAT raided and saying that five minutes before Michael Delgado's alarm was set off set last November, flashbang grenades shattered the windows of his North Minneapolis home and 18 Hennepin County officials dressed in riot gear carrying semi-automatic rifles stormed inside searching for drugs. Another 10 to 14 stood guard outside as an armored truck equipped with a sniper focused on the house. And the search, um, Hennepin County District Judge Tanya Bransford ruled was unconstitutional. She wrote that the military-style 
tactics were a violation of the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. And she was troubled when she wrote that the types of militarized actions used in this case seem to be uh, a matter of customary business practice now uh, for the Hennepin uh, Drug and uh, Drug Task Force. And so uh, here you have, have a judge ruling that a search was unconstitutional purely because they used too much force. And for me, I think this is a great thing. Having been on the receiving end of one of these mm -hmm. raids and seeing what they've done, I've been saying for several years how over the top they were with this. And it, it has, in fact, become very mundane. You look here in Clark County and in the, the country beyond, uh, they use, uh, some, some municipalities are using SWAT teams to serve uh, traffic warrants. Uh, it, it's just insane. But but what do you think of, of the idea of a, of a county judge who's ruling a search unconstitutional because of the level of force? Well, it's certainly the first time I've heard of uh, mm -hmm. such a ruling, and it's quite unusual. And I think, um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, as uh, Supreme Court of the United States Associate Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once said in his book, The Common Law, the, p the path of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. And experience has shown us, you know, we always hear about excessive force, mm -hmm. uh, or alleged or, uh, excessive right. force uh, by, you know, police officers in arrest. And so this goes the other way, and it's quite unusual. Yeah. Uh, and the, ex in the extent that, uh, m you know, maybe this is a watershed case. Uh, one would hope so. Yeah, the, the problem with a, a lot of these cases on um, uh, on the initial level, the district court level, is that the the losing side of, of the ruling will appeal it, and it goes up to an appellate level of an intermediate level, or in, in Nevada's case, uh, goes right to the uh, state supreme court as our one appellate court. And uh, sometimes these rulings, which sound so good and just to us, will get overturned by you know by a higher level court and um, I would hope this is not one of those cases uh, Ben Fecht of the uh, the legislative director of the ACLU of Minnesota said police are supposed to be out there protecting their communities rather than treating people like their enemies in a combat zone and and predictably uh, uh, Jim Franklin the executive director of uh, Minnesota Sheriff's Association uh, said that the ruling was dangerous and limited the ability of police to protect themselves when going into potentially dangerous situations. My question to her, he said, is are you going to attend the dead cop's funeral? And, you know... I don't know, do, do, do cops attend their victims' funerals? Uh, yeah, that's a good, <laughs> good question. No, not, not unless they think a riot's going to break out as a result yeah. of it. Um, and, you know, I absolutely respect the job that law enforcement does. My sister retired after 26 years on the job. But it is not by far the most dangerous job in America. That would be lumberjacks, seconded by fishermen. The police officers clock in at number 15 on that. And I, every cop deserves to go home safe at the end of their shift, absolutely. But the idea that they go into every situation like it's a combat zone uh, is, is just Turn, turning the whole fabric and tenor of this country in a in a much darker direction, you know. Uh, what do you think? How do we come to an answer on on things like this? Where's where's the balance between our civil liberties and a police state? It's been very disturbing. You, you think when you hear about these cases involving, you know, a Caucasian police officer. A killing an African American uh, person, you think that that's, you know, hopefully you think or maybe hope that you won't hear one of those, again. and then the next day or next week, and it's it's just it's just it's repetitive, it's it's continuous, it's one after another, and so I I don't have an answer. I think a lot of this stems from the apathy in the community among their elected officials if you really want to see changes you have to look to people who you want to see make the changes that you see fit for yourself in your community it starts with who's running for sheriff you know if there's a small 
a smaller candidate that might not be supported by the police union like the two people who come to my mind are Lori Bish and Ted Moody sure. who have tried to run in the past few times and have both been shot down who I thought actually that they were not the hand-picked successors ever since Ralph Lamb basically is what we have had mm -hmm. so if you want to see a change you have to vote for those changes yes. if you don't like the way the judges are handing down rulings you have to vote for judges who you think might make a change or you know look to the ways that you might look at certain things do your homework on these individual candidates i feel like no one really looks at the judges when they run not a lot of people they're all focused on the big money things like the senate races and the congressional mm -hmm. races i would say that less than twenty five thousand to thirty thousand people vote on these individual judge races would you agree with that on the individual or at least our, or, or, or a lot of the or a lot that. yeah a lot of them will vote so it's super crucial to get out there and vote for these people and not just ignore that side of the ballot you have to get out there and look at these individual things because it starts from the bottom up. You know, people just think their vote gets, oh, it's lost, it's rigged, the national elections are rigged, but what about your local elections? Mm -hmm. I remember here uh, hearing about people in Alaska who had races lost and won by a handful of votes, literally. Sure. Any number of races have been decided here in Nevada by the cut of a card. Right. They, you know, do they still do that with oh, the cards? Yeah. And they've done it within the past few years. Every vote counts. Just ask Richard Churchill, who lost uh, City of North Las Vegas City Council by one vote. Oh, my yeah. God. And, and kind of in response to you, what you said, Perry, you're absolutely right uh, regarding uh, sometimes voters are not well informed. And they don't, when they go down ballot, you know, on judicial races, they, they skip them. Or if, they, if they've seen that person sign, uh, they might vote for him and unfortunately you don't get the most competent judge elected mm -hmm. uh, you know money buys you rank, name recognition which can buy you get you elected mm -hmm. not necessarily the best candidate and i think if i'll do respect i think some people would think elizabeth halverson was a perfect example of that mm -hmm. Uh, but back to your 25 percent I, I ran for district court judge in a prior presidential year and about one third of the voters dropped off down ballot in my race mm -hmm. from voting at the top and so um, at some point, if you'd like to talk about, you know, the, the current uh, statistics as far as voter registration uh, that's in Clark County as of, as of now, and question two, we can talk about that. Okay. I'd like to talk well, about sure. that before well, yeah, the show's we, over. We can. I, I, would, I would ask you then, though, from what you just said, do you, if a person is uninformed about a judicial race, for example, or about any particular race, uh, isn't it better that they drop off and not vote than just say, oh, well, okay, Not for me. That sounds like an Irish name, or that you know. Well, what, that pe sounds like well, this what people will do is the the parties. You'll get if you're registered as a Republican, you'll get a flyer about this time of year, maybe mm -hmm. a, a couple weeks from a week from now, and it'll say this is who the Nevada Republican or Nevada Democratic Party right. endorses, and they want you to vote, and it'll go down the ticket, down the line, and it includes judges and educational people. So a lot of people will just go right down the party ticket line and vote every single one, even though these are supposedly nonpartisan, mm -hmm. they have these endorsements. So I feel like that gets people a disproportionate, not a disproportionate, but a good amount or chunks of these votes are just purely where you're vo voting. For yeah, and you're blocked. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's just is what it is. I've been guilty of doing that. But also, I, I'd say a lot of people just don't even that don't really look at that. They just there. We have so many people in this country who are uninformed, unengaged in the in this political process, even though it determines most everything about how we're going to be able to live our lives in the future. And, and it, yes, the, the ideal solution is that we have a more informed electorate. But barring that, um, how does how does one break through, Bruce? How, how does, you know, other than the bigger budget for for signs along along the side of the road, how, how does one get the ear of the voter, especially when, when you're talking about, uh, you don't have debates with the other judge, judicial candidates, right. for example. Unless you're on John Ralston's show, unless he oh. invites you on. <laughs> um, well, I guess I, re regarding your, your question, I can relate to that in, in the context of, I want to talk to you about 2010 sure. and then and in 2000, and, and this year. Um, in 2009, our legislature created uh, uh, seven new district court judgeships and uh, so uh, candidates ran in 2010 they were open seats and the Supreme Court determined they were going to only be four-year terms mm -hmm. so in 2014 there were 32 district court races Slots. on the ballot <laughs> there were 20 
district court family division uh, races on the ballot, plus some miscellaneous justice court races, various of the town, Clark County townships. So you know that that really favors incumbents, of course, because you know people they get lost, they don't recognize the name, or they don't like the name, or they didn't see their sign. They'll they'll skip it, or mm -hmm. you know they're, they're they won't make an informed decision. I don't think either one. I think making an uninformed decision, making no decision, is just as bad as is making a decision based on n no due diligence. So you know. Hmm. Voters can do their due diligence if they're going to check out anybody else, a person they meet, or a vendor. So go, I heard Google their Google their name. Yeah. Go mm -hmm. online. Most people don't care about judges until they wind up in front of them. Right, and it's too late then sometimes. So I heard uh, I heard someone say say it uh, once. I kind of remember exactly who it was, but they said when approaching a situation, the the best thing you can do is make the right decision. The second best thing you can do is make the wrong decision, and the worst thing you can do is make, make no, no decision. decision. Yeah. So is that would that be the take you would take in the voting booth also? I have to think about that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's uh, but, yeah, that, that's the U.S. military's. Uh, oh, is that? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what's unusual this year is, you know, because Nevada created the Court of Appeals, and and two of the local district court judges were appointed to the Court of Appeals. They were created these openings, and so this on this ballot, you're only going to have about ten or eleven races on your ballot. You're going to have, you know, the presidential race. You're going to have a U.S. Senate race. You're going to have your congressional yeah. district. Mm -hmm. You're going to have your state assembly. senate, your assembly. Yeah. Uh, maybe your uh, university regent race, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have two district court judge races, and maybe a few ballot uh, questions, uh, uh, yeah. and, and then maybe a justice court race, depending on your township, and um, and so it's and not the that questions. much homework you have to do. So there's there, there's going to be maybe 11 races on your ballot. So hopefully the voters the voters can do a little more uh, research. So when you get your sample ballots, do do a little bit of research. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let, you know, let me just touch on it for a moment. Uh, running for judge is, is you know, it, it can be a difficult process because it, it can yeah. be very frustrating. Uh, are, are you uh, one who would favor election or appointment of judges? I mean, we, we have both in this country, obviously, at, at mm. many of the, the higher levels, like the Supreme Court is mm. obviously an appointment. Uh, so. Which which direction do you prefer, or some blending of the two? I'm glad you mentioned that because I went to uh, I saw in 2010 Sandra Day O'Connor spoke on this issue, mm -hmm. and I'll talk about that. And I just recently went early last Saturday to a, a League of Women Voters uh, event on Saturday where they had uh, UNLV uh, a professor speak about you know the, basically the election of judicial of judges, and you know you have the federal courts where they're appointed for life. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, some judges where they can be appointed, and then they run for retention, mm -hmm. uh, or they can be appointed and run for election, mm -hmm. or they, you know, there's an open seat and you just run. And in 2010, when Sandra Day Connor uh, was here, uh, I she spoke about, and the differences are stagging. She originally got changed the law in Arizona when she was a, a judge in in. Uh, in Arizona mm -hmm. for judges to run for, run for retention. And so the, in the amount of money that's spent, the difference between if a judge is running for retention, mm -hmm. which they only need 50% plus one vote mm -hmm. for the voters and they're retained, as opposed to judges running for election, it's staggering. I, in my vague recollection, I want to say about five times more money was spent <laughs> on judges running for re-election as opposed to if a judge is running for retention. Because so there's no it, perfect system because even if you're if if there's you're appointed there's politics involved in that and well, with sure. the appointment process you know voters don't like it's been on the ballot three times it was on our ballot in 2010 to it was make on an the, appellate court no oh. for, for judges to run for retention it mm -hmm. failed in 2010 it was on our ballot twice before that in Nevada yeah, Judge, voters don't want their right at least they think they don't. They, they don't, don't want, want their, their right taken to away. Taken away, even if they don't know what they're choosing. That's true, but yes. okay. In Alaska, Senator uh, Governor Murkowski appointed his daughter Lisa mm -hmm. as a senator, and people freaked out. Then she got reelected. Then yeah. she missed the primary. She got kicked out. She lost the primary and got a successful write-in right campaign yes. and won the damn election. Mm -hmm. So not always do appointees get the boot. I mean, a lot of times mm -hmm. for sure, but not not always. Yeah. 
So, you know, so it, it's all situational, I guess. We're going to have to take one more quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijin, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. And welcome back to the show. So Bruce, let me, let me ask you, um, how long have you been practicing law? 29 years. I was admitted in 1988, and before that, I was a law clerk. You're uh, an old man. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm 61 years young. Oh, okay. I feel great. So I started my legal career in district court, clerking for a district court judge. For lawyers who've been around a long time, his, his name was Judge Wendell. He was a great judge. And um, with dignity and respect, and well-versed in the law, and so that's where I started my legal career as a district court law clerk, and I want to end my legal career uh, at district court. I have no aspirations to advance to the Court of Appeals uh, or um, the Supreme Court. You know, Maybe and, U.S. Senate in some years. No, just kidding. Know, that sounds good. But, you know, as someone who has worked as a paralegal and has been in a number of courtrooms and seen a number of judges, um, I, I think what you've got said there is a key. You know, a, a judge who treats people with respect because, um, and I, I, don't have to, I don't have to make any bones or apologize for things I say about people here. Uh, Conrad Hafen, who just recently got beaten in the, in the primary, so he's going to be off the bench. I, I saw him as just, uh, rude, uninformed, and in my opinion, he, he was not suited to be on the bench, yet he had a family name recognition, so he mm -hmm. was on the bench for a while. But I, I have seen other judges uh, sitting on the bench who, even as they're send, handing out a harsh sentence, are respectful of people, and I think that is such an important factor. When, when somebody gets that sense of entitlement, you know that that you know their opinion is better than yours, and that that they're what counts, and, and you're just dirt before them. Um, that that I just don't think that's good for the country. That's been termed. I'm sure you've heard the term "black robe fever." Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, do you um, do you have a website? How do people find out more about your campaign? And I have a website: www.gailforjudge. Dot com. And is that four? Is that spelled out F O R? Is it yes, the spelled out F O R. So it's G A L E F O R Judge. W W W. Got it. Period. Gale for Judge. Dot com. Okay, you're a busy and popular guy there, I see. Okay. But, um, but to answer your question, also, people can Google me and they'll find, you know, various hits uh, where I've been discussed, mm -hmm. where I run for judge or other stuff. Cool. Very, very cool. Very cool. So uh, before before we do go, um, I'd like to. Well, I want to thank Bruce for coming on to the show today. It's always uh, uh, good to uh, to speak with him uh, because uh, Bruce has been the weekend uh, uh, legal counsel uh, since the. Uh, 
since our nonprofit was formed, and we're we're happy to, to have very him. very grateful to have yeah. his counsel and advice. Absolutely. Uh, I'd also like to uh, remind people that uh, next Saturday night, the 29th, I believe it is, right. uh, the uh, is the fourth annual We Can Halloween party, which will be taking place down in Boulder City, and mm -hmm. you can find out more information about this either at the WeCan702.org uh, website or at the WeCan702 Facebook page. It is a it's, it's going to be it's going to be a blast. We have a lot of vendors signed up this year, bigger and better than last year. It's going to be just a wonderful time. I would highly recommend Prizes, you kick out. Yeah. Oh yeah, lots of swag, lots of good raffles. We always give away lots of good stuff. And and it's it's just a great location. It, yeah, it really is. It's going to be great weather this year. Mm -hmm. Nice yeah. and warm. Absolutely. Um, last thing, I was online and I saw that the owner of Discount Tire donated a million dollars yes. against the Arizona Marijuana Initiative. So if you are a Discount Tire fan. Let find, your displeasure yeah, be Yeah, uh, because you know, I loved them for years, but I just can't give them my business anymore after this. So let your voice be heard through your dollars, your votes. And, and we're not and we're not saying that, that you need to boycott them. We're just, as no, I, I said, let your voice <laughs> be known. <laughs> you know, let them know that, the, that this is, is a way that they can lose dollars. So until next time, thanks so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll keep digging into the stories and bringing you news from the cannabis world in Nevada and beyond. Thanks.